All right, everyone. Good morning. I think we'll get started. It's uh, day two of the STEP workshop. Um, we've got three speakers in this first session and then a break. Uh, our first speaker in this first session this morning is an invited speaker, Brian Golding from the Met Office. Brian has expertise in hydrometeorology, now casting, and mesoscale numerical weather prediction, and is the co-chair of the World Meteorological Organization's 10-year high impact weather research project, which I think you might hear a little bit about in this talk. Brian, it's all yours. Uh, take it away, and I'll give you a five-minute warning. Uh, oh. Let's try. Yep, yeah, this looks good. Looks good. Okay, you're seeing full screen? Yep. Excellent. Right. Uh, so, yes, I, um, I co-chair this project called High Weather. Um, and I will say a little bit about that and how the things we've been doing uh, might have a, an a impact on uh, the, the sorts of things that, that STEP does. So... Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about warnings to begin with, uh, then about high weather. Uh, and then I'm going to briefly go through a few of the extreme impact events of 2021 um, and look at what uh, our learning uh, can tell us ab about those events and about the forecasts and warnings uh, that, that um, accompanied them. And then uh, a little bit of analysis and some conclusions. So, um, yeah, warnings uh, are an essential uh, emergency response to uh, high impact weather uh, and indeed to weather related hazards in general. Um, and they can dramatically reduce the cost in terms of lives, property, livelihoods and essential services. So what do we mean by a warning? Um, well, uh, the precise term warning has different meanings in different countries, but I will use the um, European version, which is that anything that asks people to take action in uh, to protect themselves against a, um, a hazard is a warning, uh, regardless of the lead time and regardless of how certain it is. Uh, and so um, uh, we, we go from uh, long lead times, perhaps of, of a year or more, to plan how we might respond through training those whose job it is to respond, through preparation for an event. Um, so for most weather hazards, uh, we will probably know enough a week ahead to begin preparation. Uh, then to some activities that specifically mitigate the event, uh, evacuation, for instance, uh, or uh, temporary flood defences. And then uh, finally, the response um, phase. And of course, a warning can be really useful in terms of uh, make, get, getting the response going early. So, um, and, and typically we would expect the confidence and the uh, um, specificity of the warning to get better as the uh, as the lead time shortens. So what is the World Weather Research Programme High Impact Weather Project? Uh, well, this is the um, uh, sort of outline of the um, project definition. It's a 10 year project. Um, actually, I've got the dates wrong there. It's 2015 to 2025. Um, we have five core themes, uh, which are basically uh, orientated towards disciplines. So predictability and processes, the basic processes, forecasting, and that includes forecasting the hazard as well as the weather. Um, vulnerability, human impact, vulnerability and risk um, about the impact of the hazard, uh, communicating the information and then uh, evaluation, which really is a cross cutting activity because it covers everything. And then, uh, but, but much of our work has been carried out in terms of the cross cutting uh, uh, aspects, which are 
indicated in the in the um, long white ovals. Uh, the project addresses target G of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Um, in case there's anyone who's not familiar with it, there were three big international agreements in 2015. Uh, everybody knows about COP, which is the, the Paris Agreement for Climate Change Mitigation, which um, meets uh, has a, uh, an intergovernmental meeting every year. Uh, the Sendai framework was actually the first of the three and addresses disaster risk reduction with a 2030 timescale for uh, achieving dramatic improvements. And that has a, an international government, governmental uh, meeting every two years, and there will be one this year. Um, and yes, and we're, we're covering, well, nominally five hazards. So wind, heat waves, and air pollution, which I put together, uh, but they don't always occur together, of course. Disruptive winter weather, urban floods, and wildfires. Okay, so uh, yes, so high weather is very much uh, balanced between the physical and social sciences. You will have noticed in the pillars of the project, um, the communication and the socioeconomic impacts aspects are essentially uh, social science and perhaps engineering and medical science orientated, whereas the predictability and processes and the uh, hazard forecasting are physical science oriented and evaluation cuts across both of those. So how does that work? Well, if we start with the physical sciences, because that's perhaps where we're more comfortable, most of us, uh, we've got all these processes going on in, in the atmosphere and they lead to um, atmosphere events in the atmosphere, um, high, high impact events, which then produce weather related hazards. But on the social side, the societal side, we've equally got a lot of large scale processes going on, which are leading to some people uh, falling down the scale in terms of income, in terms of um, the, uh, the, their access to um, housing and to food and, and so on. Um, and that puts uh, creates vulnerable populations. So populations that aren't in a position to protect themselves easily. And it's when those two overlap that we get a disaster potential. And I'll come back to that when I look at the um, cases from 2021 later. So we've developed this simplified conceptual model of, of the um, warning production chain, um, looking at how value increases or decreases as we go from one step to another. So we represent the areas of expertise, the disciplines, the organizations in some case, cases as pillars of, of mountains of expertise. Um, and then we recognize that if they just do their bit in isolation and don't pass on what they what they know, then clearly um, there, there's uh, no there isn't a successful warning at the end of the at the end of the chain. So we have to build bridges, and it's the quality of those bridges that uh, determines whether or not uh, the information that's needed will reach the decision maker at the end of the end of the chain. Um, and it's worth saying that the design of such a system um, has to start from the, the decision that needs to be taken. Um, it's a slow process. It needs to uh, go up the chain and look at the ability of the different actors to provide that information on the timescale required and in the detail required. And almost inevitably, it can't be provided. So then you have to iterate and go back and say, well, would something a bit broader scale or a bit uh, less detailed be useful or could we provide it later? And then uh, through a series, a process of iteration, you end up with a working system. And once you've got a working system, then of course, a key aspect is that it needs to be fast, it needs to be reliable, 
and it needs to be direct, reaching the decision maker as fast as possible. That said, the decision maker, the user at the end of the chain uh, can still uh, be a valuable component in, in terms of all the steps because uh, the situational awareness is probably best understood by the person on the ground, at least when, when it gets close to the event. So high weather, well, as you will have seen from the dates, uh, it's somewhat over halfway through its, uh, its 10 year period. And the first five years was very much spent uh, reviewing, uh, pulling together uh, research, in particular pulling together social science research that was relevant to the warning problem, pulling together physical science that was relevant to the warning problem and putting it into a state where those on both sides and, and in particular the emergency management communities uh, can engage with, with both aspects without having to learn uh, complex uh, and, and uh, scientific, science specific language. Um, and some of the areas that we pulled information from, so there's a, um, a big development in uh, the humanitarian, particularly the humanitarian area of community based warning systems. So you get a community together and you uh, develop a warning system that suits that community and which is owned by that community. The information may come from outside, but the warning system itself is is focused on the community. Uh, the development of social media has been had a, a big impact. Uh, in enabling information to get to people, uh, but also it creates dangers in terms of fake news. And uh, it's a large part now of a weather service mission to monitor social media and to correct uh, any fake news that may, may appear. Uh, research into behavioral responses, uh, that's going on continuously. And it's a key aspect of, of a warning. How do people respond to a particular form of language? What sort of information do they actually respond to as opposed to the information they say they would like to see and so on. Impact based forecasting is uh, you could say it's flavor of the day, uh, it's flavor of the decade in weather services. The move from forecasting a hazard to forecasting its impact is clearly important. Um, how you then use that information to optimize your warning uh, is uh, not a fully understood um, uh, outcome, uh, output yet. Um, and uh, indeed, it, uh, recent research suggests that the value is most at the early warning stage uh, and uh, perhaps less uh, in, impact information is perhaps less useful when you get to the last few hours. Of course, convection permitting numerical weather prediction models have had a huge influence uh, and a huge benefit, uh, essentially, particularly in the tropics, uh, where forecasts are still pretty weak uh, because of the lack of um, uh, strongly uh, forcing uh, strong forcing from the larger scale circulation. Um, and then the, the whole process of tracking and communicating predictability, uncertainty and confidence from right through from our process understanding through our forecasts to the way we communicate it at the end. So um, what makes a good warning? Uh, the, uh, the mantra from the uh, disaster risk reduction community is that a warning must be useful, usable and used. Useful in the sense that it has the right information in it, usable in that it's communicated in a format and through media that make it accessible and used in that it results in the right behavior. And that behavior is the key success metric. That's what we need, what weather services and other uh, warning, the, those uh, other people in the warning chain need to be measuring as the success metric. Uh, the, 
Means of communication is as important as the content. Partnerships are a crucial aspect. So those bridges will only remain standing and, and be a successful means of communication if there is a true partnership, uh, each all the way down the chain. And of course, the forecast is only one source of information. Knowing the exposure and vulnerability of your community is at least as important. I mentioned community based warning systems and a co-design process in which the community is is at least as much involved as the technical experts uh, is important and it will mean that the community is much more likely to feel that they own the information they get and therefore to act on it. Uh, trust is important and so the source of the information needs to be recognized and uh, and trusted by the users. And of course, that isn't going to be the same in every country. In some countries, uh, association with government will be a strong factor. In other countries, it will be an absolute turnoff. So what can we learn from 2021? Um, well, I'll start with the Texas winter storm. Uh, the as, as I discovered at AMS, the most expensive winter storm ever in the US. Um, the meteorology was uh, interesting, fairly classic for a La Nina year. There was a split polar vortex, an extending ridge and a succession of cyclone waves down the west of the ridge, bringing ever colder air southwards. The hazards were cold snow and ice. Um, and there was a whole string of impacts, uh, 210 deaths, plus or minus, um, $130 billion of damage. And there's some very specific things there uh, associated with uh, Texas. So um, crop damage uh, was extensive, fish kills. Um, and of course, the, the one that uh, hit the headlines was the power outages. So the forecasts were very good. Uh, the warnings were out three to four days ahead with the correct temperatures. Um, interestingly, uh, there, there was a talk at AMS uh, which focused on exactly what the media said and what the media focused on was transport. Uh, I guess it would be the same here with a cold, a cold spell. Um, it's getting people off the roads so that there aren't accidents, so that the roads don't get um, blocked. Um, and that was very much, until the last minute, that was very much the focus of the media. It didn't stop there being a big crash right at the start of the event, uh, but that was, that was the um, issue. The power outages, uh, apparently there was a warning one hour ahead in the middle of the night. So that that reminds me very much of the um, the great storm in the UK, the so-called non-hurricane back in 1987. And at that time, warnings were only allowed to be out three hours ahead in, in the UK. That was the the, the policy. Um, and uh, the storm struck at three in the morning. So the warnings went out at midnight and nobody saw them. Um, very reminiscent of that. So. Uh, what about the responses? Well, the responses were actually very good. Um, the war warming stations were opened up well in advance. Apparently, a large part of the citrus crop was picked uh, in advance um, to, uh, to avoid damage. One can argue about whether the uh, pleas for people to keep off the roads had as much effect as might have been desired. But clearly the uh, response in terms of the power system was inadequate. And uh, so this is a case where we can see the physical science end doing really well. Um, the communication bit being biased, um, missing out on some of the important impacts. Um, and in particular, the uh, the power impact not apparently being picked up on 
at all uh, for whatever reason. So the next one I want to look at is Tropical Cyclone Siroja in Indonesia. Uh, and this is interesting in a very different way. Um, end of the Northeast monsoon, uh, there was an MJO in the area, tropical depressions, multiple tropical depressions. Uh, but the uh, incipient tropical cyclone, which at this stage was a tropical depression, was spinning up uh, stationary. Uh, in the uh, seas close to the, the island of Timor. And uh, basically, in its severe convection, you can see it in the satellite image there, was developing in the locations that would be the rain bands uh, of the uh, tropical cyclone when it was fully fledged. This happened overnight. Um, and there was torrential rain in the Flores Islands. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but if you can, these are the Flores Islands, the, the ones in the north of the radar picture, and uh, a torrential rain over Timor. You can see there's, there's probably basically two rain bands, one of them which hit the Flores Islands and the other one very close to the center. Um, and the forecasts, well, the final forecast uh, from ECMWF wasn't bad, although it missed, it had the rain too far south for the Flores Islands. Uh, the pre but the previous one was, although the center of the tropical cyclone was in the right place, uh, it had the rain much weaker in, and in other places, and that had fluctuated. So it was an uncertain forecast. Um, and, uh, and, and probably an, a not particularly good forecast. Uh, so the result was 272 deaths, over 100,000 displaced, uh, large loss of power, transport, food. Uh, a lot of bridges were destroyed, uh, particularly on Timor, and an estimate of half a billion dollars of damage. Um, OK, so the forecast um, was certainly uncertain. If you look at the ECMWF forecast down there, uh, it's uh, grossly underpredicted the amount of rain over Timor. Um, I, I couldn't get the information for um, the Flores Islands and, and there wasn't a, uh, a rain gauge in, in the right location anyway. Uh, there was a flash flood warning went out about 12 hours in advance, but it was very broad brush and it focused on coastal flooding um, as you might expect from a uh, from a tropical cyclone or an incipient tropical cyclone. So in terms of response, I think that the impacts were certainly underestimated, but they were, um, the impacts were very varied according to where people were. So on the Flores Islands, uh, a lot of uh, ra relatively small villages were completely destroyed by mudslides. And that was where most of the loss of life was. On Timor, uh, the, apart from the destruction of bridges and transport and, and power and communication facilities, uh, there were very few fatalities uh, and it was basically uh, just uh, serious flooding in, in, the, um, in the main towns and cities. Um, Clearly, there was a feel that the warnings only reached the local uh, emergency man, uh, emergency response people. The public warnings were, uh, if there was one, it was very generic and uh, relatively unhelpful. And indeed, the regional head of the uh, of the um, emergency response resigned as as a result. So overall, we have a relatively poor forecast from the physical sciences. We have a, a relatively poor response at the communication end, uh, some of which can be blamed on the quality of the forecasts, but not all. In Europe, uh, we have a flooding event again. Uh, we have a Rossby wave train associated with um, the intense convection in Indonesia uh, in July, which um, also resulted in uh, some of the other events that happened that month. Extreme rainfall, um, flash floods, landslides, 
and uh, a lot of deaths, a lot of damage, and again, effects on transport and power. The um, picture down the bottom there shows the uh, simulated uh, flow for a very large, um, uh, for the rainfall in one of the catchments that was most, that was worst affected. And you can see this is the, the, the HQ100 is the 100 year return period level. The gauge failed at uh, this higher level and went, uh, the, the simulation suggests the water went on up and up. Um, I guess it's probably not quite like that because the, um, uh, the, the valley will have spread out. So the area averaged rain warning was excellent, um, a really good forecast, but at the level of the individual uh, mountain catchment, um, it was much more uncertain and it was only in the last day beforehand that the rain, uh, the, the rain rates were being reached on that scale. Uh, and that's an advantage of the uh, convective scale prediction, of course, but it needs to be known further ahead and further ahead. There was a lot of uncertainty in location. So uh, and the other problem with this one was that people simply didn't recognize the level of risk. Um, they they didn't apparently have an evacuation plan for the area that was that was flooded. So, uh, yes, the physical science worked well, but it needed to be better. The hydrological interpretation was certainly not as good as it could have been. And I think that the communication between the two, particularly at the early stages, uh, could have uh, there could have been a communication of the meteorology which enabled the possibility of ex the, um, uh, the extreme values that were observed to be much better captured. So I'm running morning. out of time, so I will quickly run through the Henan floods, which had many of the same issues. Um, but here the rainfall was truly phenomenal, 200 millimeters in an hour, 600 millimeters in the day. And there is a feeling that once again here, people simply didn't believe that that much rainfall could fall. And I'll skip Ida because you know all about that. So um, these were all, many of these were extreme events beyond anything experienced. And I think there is a new issue that, that we're seeing that um, how do you communicate something that is beyond the reasonable worst case? Uh, because the reasonable worst case is what people plan for. Um, warnings need to prepare people. The mantra is no surprises. Um, and that means not just that the weather wasn't a surprise, but its consequences were not a surprise. And that includes consequences for groups with specific vulnerabilities. And I did skip Ida, but one of the issues in Ida was that uh, many of the fatalities occurred in groups with specific vulnerabilities. In Louisiana, it was the care home uh, residents. And in uh, New York, it was the basement residents. Um, how good are our models and our uh, simulation systems at predicting extreme events, unprecedented events? Can we actually quantify that? Um, the EFI that ECMWF use is great as an attention getter, but it can't easily be turned into uh, an impact assessment. And uh, an impact assessment often requires this coupling of Earth system components at very high resolution. So um, that's my presentation. I'll just uh, emphasize that I didn't do any of the work. Um, the content has been generated by members of the High Weather Project. And of course, it draws on information that's come from many uh, people around the world, particularly in the media and also in weather services. And of course, I'm very grateful to them for providing that information. And just to finish with uh, the High Weather Book Towards the Perfect Weather Warning is expected to be published in March. So um, look out for that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much.
Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them in there. And we do have time for one question in case someone would like to ask. So if you would, please use the reactions button to raise your hand. Uh, Falco. Uh, yes, so uh, my question is, um, you didn't talk about uh, false alarms really. And I think that's one of the big problems that we could, why people don't heed the warnings we give out is because of the false alarms. Like I've been warned multiple times and nothing happened. And yes, now they're saying the same thing again and then it happens. So I think that's, that's a big problem, uh, I, just uh, anecdotally. Yeah. Um... It, it, false alarms is an interesting one. There's a lot of research happened and, and happening on it. Um, and of course, for probabilistic warnings, um, you know, uh, if you if you if you've got a 10 percent prob and that's the level at which you want to warn, then 90 percent of warnings are going to be false. Um, and I think it's it's about how you communicate it both before and after. So you communicate it beforehand. Uh, for instance, um, you know, when there's a tornado warning, 90% of the area will not get a tornado. Um, and that's got better. Those, the, those areas have got smaller, uh, but there's still that issue. Um, but if you warn people, this is the area that's at risk, you need to take uh, um, protective action in case a, a tornado gets you. Uh, there will be a tornado in this area. Uh, that's that's a part of it. And I think afterwards, um, showing people where the tornado actually is can be really helpful. The fact that there was one and it was near, um, I think is it's then not a false alarm. It's a it's a near a near a near miss. <laughs> um, and. Um, uh, there have been various various uh, reports. Um, I think particularly the um, professional uh, recipients are particularly keen to have warnings, even when they are uh, they they don't happen. Um, so there there are there are differences between your different customers. So tailoring the warning, I think, is is an issue which I didn't talk about, but uh, is certainly important. Great, thanks. All right, um, if you have more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Thanks very much, Brian. We'll move on to our next speaker, and that's going to be Falco Ute. He'll be talking about tropical cyclones in global convection permitting simulations. So Falco, go for it. I see your screen looks good, and I'll give you a two-minute warning. All right. Um, yeah, thank you, Craig, and thanks to the organizers for uh, allowing me to speak here. So this talk really has two parts. Uh, the first part is the good, um, essentially the added value of global storm resolving uh, or convection permitting global cams. There are so many names for these uh, models, but yeah. So the first part is about the good. And the second part is about the not so good because we still have uh, tremendous biases in these models. Um, this talk is particularly about tropical cyclones, so I thought it, it's a good idea to um, start out with uh, the current method of how does the National Hurricane Center, for example, uh, predict tropical cyclones. And uh, it's a, essentially a two-pronged approach. So they're using global models to look at the formation of tropical cyclones and the track. And on the other hand, they look at regional models because tropical cyclones are essentially mesoscale phenomena. Uh, with small inner cores, so they need high you need high resolution to simulate the inner core to get the intensity right and the structure right. The global models simply don't have that resolution. So we have this two uh, track, double track approach. We look at global models uh, for formation and track, and we look at regional models. Often they have vortex following domains for intensity and structure and other impact uh, um, metrics such as rainfall. Uh, now, this is problematic because on the one hand, it's inconsistent. You use information from one model and you combine it with information from another model, but they may have different error statistics and you try to mesh them together and that's where the human forecaster comes in. So it's inconsistent. There's a, an underlying inconsistency. And even if you don't see this as bad, 
Uh, I like to say this is an inelegant approach and I strive for scientific elegance. So a scientific elegance in this uh, aspect to me is to have everything from one model. And that's where our uh, global convection permitting or global storm resolving models come in. Uh, they essentially, uh, they, they combine the two things. We have now uh, um, convection permitting resolution on a global scale. And uh, of course the, the big uh, bottleneck here is computing power. So uh, why didn't we have them before? Because our computers weren't large enough, uh, our computers weren't powerful enough uh, but now with the, uh, with the uh, computing power uh, increasing over the last uh, years and decades, now we're actually there. We can run models that have three uh, kilometer or four kilometer grid spacing uh, across the whole globe. We can run these models, not in real time yet, not there yet, uh, maybe in a couple of years, but at least in research mode. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, one particular simulation here that we produced for the Diamond Initiative. So that's a 3.75 kilometer MPAS simulation. And you can see here, I plotted the cloud field. And besides just looking fairly realistic, almost looks like a satellite image. You can see a uh, tropical cyclones. There's a hurricane off the coast of uh, Northern Florida here in the Atlantic. And there is a hurricane in the East Pack and then a developing uh, tropical storm to the Southeast. So uh, producing this model produced the wealth of, uh, running this model for 40 days produced a wealth of data um, and, and sifting through that data, mining that data is one of the uh, projects that I've been doing and are, I'm particularly interested in the tropical cyclones. How do they look like in this model? Uh, is it something that maybe in five to 10 years we can run in real time and the Hurricane Center can make better forecasts? So to answer this question, uh, first we need to uh, get the tropical cyclones out of the model output. And uh, with regional models like WORF, this is actually not that difficult because your domain is centered on the tropical cyclone. But when you run a global model, there is an extra step. You have to actually track the TCs uh, in the global atmosphere. And here this was done with the GFDL vortex tracker. And it's not a too straightforward process because you have to regrid the original output to a 0.5 degree light long mesh. Then you have to compile the tracker and run it. Um, uh, in the end though, after a couple of weeks work, you get um, um, the tropical cyclones in the model. You get text files, which have the position, the intensity, and the size of the TC in this uh, global storm resolving simulation. And of course, what we do then is a, a straightforward model verification. We compare uh, the model, uh, the simulated TCs uh, to observations. And observations here is the Ivy Tracks uh, database. So those are all observed tropical cyclones uh, that's data compiled uh, from national meteorological centers. So it's not reanalysis, it's not real observations, but it's what human forecasters analyzed uh, as tropical cyclones. Okay, so let's uh, go right ahead into uh, the analysis here. Again, this is one simulation, 40 day period, August, September, 2016. So that's the classic Northern hemisphere hurricane season. And this is what happened uh, in, in reality uh, in that 40-day um, period. There were about, there were exactly 24 tropical cyclones. Uh, most of them occur in the Western Pacific. Um, this is uh, expected, uh, that's the hotspot for uh, typhoons. But there's also tropical cyclones here. These are East Pac hurricanes, and then these are uh, Atlantic hurricanes. Now, let's compare it to the storm resolving impasse. So that's the 3.75 kilometer impasse here. And if you just compare the numbers, it's actually pretty good. It's for each basin, it's off by at most one tropical cyclone. And this is really good because if you think about a 40 day uh, simulation, that's well beyond the predictability limit, what we think uh, in terms of day-to-day -day forecasting. So of course the tracks aren't exactly the same, but just the, that the numbers are so close to the observations is, is really remarkable especially when you compare it to um, lower resolution versions of the same model. So um, I wanted to see how much or yeah, how much uh, improvement is there in the 3.75 kilometer model over an MPAS version that has the resolution of a standard uh, NWP model. So I took 15 kilometers. And if you come, if you look at the numbers here, it only produces 14 tropical cyclones. Uh, so clearly there's a, a big improvement going to 3.75 kilometer um, resolution. 
And uh, this improvement is even more drastic when you compare it to what we think of today's climate models. Uh, so this is a 60 kilometer impasse, everything the same, initialized with the same data, um, just the resolution is lower. And it, it barely captures uh, the TCs in the, um, in the Eastern Pacific here. So if you look at overall for the whole globe, it has nine TCs, but it really lost the tropical cyclones in the Eastern Pacific and in the Atlantic. So clearly the bottom line here is the 3.75 kilometers much better than the lower resolution versions of the same model initialized with the same data, et cetera, et cetera. But what's really important, uh, I think for global modeling is intensity. So uh, we've been struggling to get the intensity right of hurricanes. And what we're seeing here is the time series of the observed tropical cyclone. So each black line is the intensity uh, of one of the 24 observed tropical cyclones. Um, if you look at the right y-axis here, that denotes the, uh, the Saffir-Simpson category. So during that period in 2016, there were two or three Cat 4 storms. There wasn't really a Cat 5, but it, it shows you that uh, essentially on this 40-day period, there was a, a period of activity early on during the first two weeks, mostly tropical storms, maybe Cat 1, hurricane. But then uh, during the latter part of the 40 day period, there, there were some really uh, strong major hurricanes. And it turns out that this 3.75 kilometer impasse captured the intensity pretty well. Again, there is not a one to one correspondence. We don't expect that because we're having a 40 day free running uh, simulations. But it does seem to capture that there was essentially weak storms early on and then a little bit of a lull, and then the big, uh, the big storms came uh, during the, uh, the latter 20 days of that period. So uh, clearly this is a pretty good um, simulation here. Again, especially if we compare it to the MPAS run at 15 kilometer resolution, it just doesn't have the resolution to uh, resolve the inner core, thus it cannot produce the accurate intensity. And the same happened uh, with a 60 kilometer MPAS, uh, again, this is a climate model resolution. And if you don't tune the model, if you just let the model do what it's supposed to do, you don't get really hurricanes in those simulations, uh, simply because it cannot resolve the mesoscale structure of the storms. So to sum it all up here, um, I'm using the metric called accumulated cyclone energy or ACE. It's essentially a metric of the duration and intensity of all storms combined, summed up. And the top bar here, that's from the observations with the error bars. And then there's the three simulations. And um, well, you can say the 3.75 kilometer impasse is a little bit on the high end, uh, but I'm actually not too um, concerned about that because this is an uncoupled simulation. So it, this, you may know that uh, strong hurricanes create a cold wake. So they upwell cold water and that puts a break on their intensity. So this simulation doesn't have that. It essentially have you have hurricane force winds blowing over the ocean, but the SST are in cooling. So the storms um, are probably too intense compared to reality. But anyway, so uh, if you look at 15 kilometer and 60 kilometer, there's simply no way that these simulations can capture the intensity and thus they cannot uh, capture the co correct ACE. Uh, now that let's move into the part of the talk where I'm, I want to show you that, yes, there's improvement uh, going from, let's say, 10 or 15 kilometer resolution to a three or four kilometer resolution, but there's still uh, glaring biases. And I, I call this as that the model doesn't have the fine motor skills uh, necessary to really reproduce nature. So on the left here, what's shown is a, um, um, a WSR 88D, so a radar reflectivity image of Hurricane Irma of 2017. That was just moving uh, uh, westward uh, to the north of Puerto Rico. So that's from the Puerto Rico radar here. And what we see is a, is a canonical hurricane structure. We have an eye, a clear eye, then the eye wall. This storm actually has a secondary eye wall that um, is concentric with the primary eye wall. Uh, but there's also lots of stratiform rain. And that's something that we cannot really get in the um, in a kilometer scale model. So this is... Um, um, a sample cyclone from the 3.75 kilometer impasse. And if you compare these two, you can see, yeah, it's definitely very different. It's uh, too bulky, too broad, too intense. Uh, it, it, you know, when, you, when we think about convection permitting models, we kind of know, yes, it, it 
doesn't really reproduce the fine scale structure. It's more like lava lamp uh convection in the model so we have blobs of air rising very strong grip point storms and that's what we see here but it's still uh quite a bit of an improvement over the 15 kilometer and 60 kilometer impasse so i'm plotting the actual grid cells here so there's no effect of smoothing and if you look at the 60 kilometer impasse well that's how your hurricanes look like in the reflectivity field in a climate model uh there's maybe one grid cell that uh encompasses the eye but Clearly, we go left here. There's big improvement, but again, we're not there where the observations are. And this was just one model. So how do other models do? I'm going to show you something uh, from the Diamond Initiative, which was a, a global convection permitting model in comparison. Um, seven, I think seven centers uh, contributed models. Um, in the table here, you see on the left, those are the model names. Uh, fairly uh, um, popular models like FE3, uh, GEOS, and IFS. Uh, NICAM uh, is the um, Japanese model. So essentially all uh, global meteorological centers provided the global storm resolving version of their model. Here in that, uh, uh, in that column uh, outlined in yellow, that's the uh, uh, grid spacing of the models. And you can see they're all essentially under five kilometers. So they're all explicit convection. Uh, some of them have uh, scale aware parameterizations, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, anyway, so all models under five kilometer resolution, except for UM, that the, that's the exception that breaks the rule. Uh, and all of these simulations were run for the same 40 day period and initialized with uh, ECMWF uh, uh, data. Uh, also, the sea surface temperature was coming from ECMWF. Um, it turns out that all of these models, despite having more or less the same horizontal grid spacing, produce very different tropical cyclones. And these are just snapshots of the strongest cyclone in each model. And if you just look at them, uh, you see a vast variety of storms. Um, just to pick a few on the top left, that's the French uh, Page model. And that produces these donut storms. We call them donut storms or truck tire storms. So essentially, these storms are incredibly strong and, and big, and they're actually unrealistic. So our patch produces storms that are unrealistic, too strong and too broad. On the other hand, we have um, in the lower uh, um, row here, we have the SAM model that doesn't produce anything that resembles a tropical cyclone. Um, there is, uh, it, it has a very noisy structure in the surface winds. Uh, but no real uh, eyewall, uh, no real tropical cyclone uh, in terms of, of um, canonical structure with eyewall and rain bands. And also the icon model in the top again produces very weak storms. And uh, what we consider the best operational model, IFS has some funny looking TCs, I have to say, in their uh, convection permitting. Um, uh, version of the model, um, very small and very symmetric. Uh, again, probably bias doesn't look too realistic. Uh, if I had to pick models that are producing fairly realistic cyclones, it's MPAS. Um, of course, I'm biased here from NCAR, but also FE3 and GEOS. These uh, three are probably the ones that produce the structures here in the 10 meter winds that I would say that looks um, more realistic. So uh, I dug through all these models and the question of course is uh, what model does best? And there's not an easy answer. So what we're seeing here is the wind pressure relationship, black is observations, yellow is uh, simulation. And um, just quickly looking at it, it looks like, well, GEOS in this case really nailed this pressure wind relationship and it did. Uh, so maybe GEOS is the best model. Um, now what we're looking here at is size. So the extent of the tropical storm force winds in each compass quadrant, uh, R34 stands for the radius of the 34 knot wind. And again, comparing black and orange, uh, GEOS looks uh, really remarkable. It's, it's almost on top of the observations. We rarely see that with tropical cyclones in global models. Um, MPAS seems to be a little bit big. So clearly we think, well, GEOS must be the winner. Well, it turns out that GEOS produces too many and too strong tropical cyclones, as we can see here in the accumulated cyclone energy uh, metric. So now it looks like uh, MPAS and UM are the better models. So bottom line is there's no 
one model that does best in all regards. Uh, each of them has uh, unique biases um, that, that come out in this uh, intercomparison. And in the last uh, one minute or two, I want to so briefly touch upon what this intercomparison is good for. Well, it's uh, to figure out that biases that the model developers then can correct. We have here on top the Arpash, which produces storms that are off the charge. That would be your uh, category six or sevens um, if they existed. And on the other hand, we have Icon, which produces storms that are too weak here if you compare the orange to the uh, gray. And that turns out is because of the surface flux formulation. Uh, Icon has uh, the um, relationship between momentum flux going into the ocean, that's the break on your tropical cyclone intensity is too strong compared with our page. And on the other hand, the heat flux, that's the fuel that comes out of the ocean in the tropical cyclone. Icon is on the lower end, whereas our page is probably too strong. I don't have observations here. Uh, this is just to show you how we can use these uh, these intercomparisons to to figure out or to to uh, find biases and then later on dig into the processes that cause the biases and correct them. And with that, I'd like to close. So I, I hope I uh, could convince you at least a little bit uh, that these global storm resolving models uh, combine the advantages of global and higher uh, regional models of today's versions of those models because we have global coverage of uh, kilometer scale resolution uh, and these models capture tropical cyclones uh, better than current generations of global models however there are still biases and each model has unique biases uh, some models do better than others but there's really not the best model and there's still work for the model developers but i think they're Overall, this will be a great step towards better tropical cyclone prediction. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions. All right. Thanks very much, Falco. Uh, there's one question in the chat from Jared, but for the sake of time, I'm going to ask you to just respond to it in the chat. And we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Stan Trier. Stan's going to talk about simulation of a land falling tropical cyclone tornado environments in WARF. Okay, can you all see this? Uh, yep, looks good to uh, me. Screen? Okay. Um, all right, well, I'm going to continue on the theme of uh, tropical cyclones following Falco, but talk about a much more specific aspect of them, and that being their tendency to uh, produce tornadoes when they make landfall in the southeastern United States. Um, and there are many hazards with landfalling tropical cyclones. This is perhaps a somewhat underappreciated one. And um, this work is part of the Vortex Southeast um, program. So we've received some funding from NOAA in addition to um, funding from the STEP program. And uh, my collaborators are Derek Carroll, who's a long-term visitor at NCAR, and Dave Hievich and George Bryan, who uh, many of you, many of you know. Um, so this research really has three parts. There's an observation-based component uh, using NAR reanalysis fields to look at environments supporting different types of uh, tornadic tropical cyclone cases, including strong landfalling tropical cyclones with many tornadoes, um, many tornadoes produced by weaker storms, which actually is somewhat more of a forecasting challenge. Uh, cases that primarily produce tornadoes near the coast and also some tor cases that produce them far inland as well as null cases. And um, we, I've, I've listed um, the different um, categories. There are five different categories and listed the storms uh, that we grouped into these categories. And Derek Carroll did a lot of work um, categorizing these cases and grouping them. Um, what we did is we made composites of the environments for each case and composited many different predictors for tropical cyclone tornadoes, which you see listed down below. And in that effort, uh, David Hivich uh, made you know, outstanding contributions in designing the machinery to, to make the composites. So we're in the process of synthesizing all of these results and uh, this spring, we plan to, to write this part of the study up. But this being step, 
today I'm going to focus more on the modeling aspect of this, and this is the second component of the study where we've selected a few individual cases from these five different composites to simulate with WARF and look at in a lot more detail. And there's also a third part of the study, which is higher resolution, almost LES scale with CM1, which George is involved in uh, looking at some, some of the detailed structures of the rain bands that produce the tornadic storms. Um, so I'm gonna start off by talking about two example cases. Um, like Falco mentioned, uh, Hurricane Irma, it's a very popular case. It was a very strong uh, Cat 3 uh, hurricane, which made landfall in Florida a few years ago. And then an inland case, uh, very different, which is um, Tropical Storm Bill. Um, and there are three main sort of aspects in this modeling, uh, wharf model part of the study. Uh, we do physical processes on the mesoscale environment uh, in the vicinity of these landfalling tropical cyclone tornadoes, and these are, con are conducted over a regional scale domain, which I show pictured in the bottom left, and this is the example showing the simulated and observed track for uh, Tropical Storm Bill. Um, um, since NOAA is our, uh, our sponsor, uh, we also do uh, sort of a mini ensemble uh, that's sort of patterned after the HREF. Uh, it's a little bit different, and HREF is a small physics ensemble, so it differs from the, the NCAR WARF ensemble, but we're using WARF. And then um, since we're not uh, at the resolution where we can actually simulate tornadoes, uh, we want to develop model surrogates for tornado likelihood uh, within the tropical cyclone rain bands, and Derica has been quite involved with that. Um, so this is um, Hurricane Irma, and in the upper left, you see a comparison of the simulated and observed track, and they're very close uh, along the west coast of Florida. An interesting aspect about this case is almost all of the tornadoes were right along the east coast of Florida. Um, this is very interesting aspect. It may be partly governed by the scale of the Florida Peninsula, but there's some meteorological factors involved as well. Um, in, the, in the bottom uh, right, uh, I'm plotting the updraft helicity through two different layers, um, the zero to three kilometer layer and the two to five kilometer layer. And that's actually defined all the way to the right. Um, um, so what we can see is that it's actually a very good um, predictor in this case. And, and Ryan Sobash has found this for um, severe weather in continental locations uh, in like the Southern Plains. We're finding it's, pretty good for these tropical cyclone tornadoes as well. You can see from hour 36 to 60 is when most of the tornadoes are occurring and there's a big, uh, a big increase in the, in the updraft helicity. So in this plot, uh, I'm working from um, uh, left to right, sort of decreasing in scale. Um, and this is our one kilometer simulations of Irma. Uh, and you can see, um, it's uh, realist, has a realistic structure. There are some of the limitations that Falco talked about, maybe not quite an, as much stratiform rain as actually occurs, but it, it has a good um, uh, simulation of these outer rain bands. And in the box on the right, um, as we go to the middle panel, you can see very cellular structure within the rain band. I'm plotting the three kilometer storm relative winds and you can see well-defined circulation centers. If you take the storm that's down in the lower right and, and move to the panel that's all the way over to the right, uh, you can see well-defined uh, mesocyclone and rotation. It's a fairly small storm. Uh, it looks very similar to some of these um, simulations that Bill McCall and Morris did in the late 90s of these sort of small, um, uh, supercells within, within hurricanes. And there's about a 30 meter per second updraft at three kilometers. So it, this is fairly well resolved, this mesocyclone on, with that in our one kilometer simulation. So I wanna look at some of the environmental factors that we've simulated that uh, may be leading to the tornadoes forming along the coast and 
In the left panel, um, you see the zero to two kilometer vertical shear. It's strongest inland near the center of the storm with very strong values of over 30 meters per second through the lowest two kilometers. And uh, the most favorable cape, um, which is influenced uh, by the, the distribution of it is influenced by the land sea contrast, uh, the tropical cyclone cloudiness over the peninsula and horizontal advection. It's right at the coast and where these two areas are favorable and overlap right along the East Coast is a real favorable environment, large cape, uh, large shear for the, for the tornadoes. There's also enhanced uh, large scale convergence uh, on the east side of the tropical cyclone. So now I'm gonna to move to the contrasting case of tropical storm Bill. It made a landfall on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Uh, and this is very interesting because it didn't really produce that many tornadoes in the first couple of days. Uh, you can see in the upper right after it makes landfall, but then it gets into the um, lower Ohio River Valley, mid Mississippi Valley. And there's this big cluster of tornadoes on day three in Southern Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky. Um, and um, others have, have studied this case as well um, and uh, have remarked on the fact that it actually has a little bit of an intensification later on this day three, and they attribute it um, to this um, inland sea effect where there's a lot of rainfall, there's a lot of evaporation from the surface. I, I think what was more important to the tornadoes, and I'm gonna show this in upcoming slides, was this, its interaction with a, a frontal boundary, which was sort of stalled over the area for several days. Um, and you can see on day three, again, the updraft helicity is a very good uh, predictor. Um, you can see there's this, uh, uh, you, you see that it's very well correlated um, temporally with the tornadoes uh, on day three. Uh, and has values that are greater than Ryan Sobash's threshold for continental uh, uh, tornadoes with, you know, which he, which is 75 meters squared per second squared in that, that horizontal line there. So um, this looks at the one kilometer domain of this simulation. You can see I've got the radar on the, on the left. And you can see the structural characteristics, at least on the mesoscale, are very similar. Um, somewhat different from Irma in this case, there are centers, the centers of simulated strong updraft helicity are not in these discrete cells, but they're in these rather continuous uh, rain bands. Uh, and I've got them plotted on the reflectivity in the middle panel. And, and you can see all the way on the right, I'm comparing the uh, updraft helicity centers over a six hour period with the observed tornadoes. And there's a little bit of an offset. This is a 79, 80 hour forecast, and there's a little bit of a placement error. But the important thing is they're all within this frontal zone. And that's um, where the vertical shear is enhanced in this case. And this seems to be really important, uh, the storm moving inland and encountering this pre-existing frontal zone where the uh, the circle, the shear associated uh, on the right side of the of the tropical cyclone gets enhanced within this this frontal zone, um, and you can see that in these plots. I've got the and you can see the rear side of the storm, but very strong enhanced shear uh, on the right side of the storm center. Uh, and that's right where the tornadoes are occurring. And those are the black dots uh, uh, in the panel on the, on the right. And you can see there's a maximum uh, in the low level shear. It's not as strong as it was with Irma because Irma was a much stronger storm. Uh, it was a cap three hurricane. This was uh, uh, at this point, a tropical depression or weak tropical storm. Um, so um, that was uh, a simulation over the regional scale domain, which I have plotted here uh, in the upper left. Um, we did some experiments where we changed the domain size, and it, it turned out that it, you know, we compared it to, I'm, I'm zooming in on the same area, but with the Kona scale domain on, on the plots that are in the center and toward the right. Uh, and you can see that it's a pretty similar storm structure, but the shear is actually 
a lot less. So there was a big sensitivity to the size of the domain. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, we see this before um, that when you have a very small area, if you have good lateral boundary conditions, the simulation doesn't really get too far away from reality. And this is, this is about an 80 hour simulation. Um, so that, you know, we're in a much bigger domain and we don't really uh, capture the strong shear as well. So I tried an experiment where um, I um, started the bigger domain uh, later thinking that would be left drift, less drift, but it really didn't make much difference. And that's what I have plotted up in the right. You can see with the weaker shear, you have uh, weaker updraft helicities, which is in the time series uh, on the bottom panel. So that, that really made a difference in this case. Um, so this, this uh, slide right here is just looking, looking uh, you know, kind of looking at this um, physics ensemble, um, just seeing, you know, what the variability is in a three-day forecast. And this is really getting a little bit beyond the time range of step. Uh, but you can see that structural characteristics are fairly similar. Um, uh, this is a big system, so you'd expect the model to do pretty well even three days out, but there are about 300 kilometer scale, horizontal scale uh, uh, differences among this ensemble in exact location, and actually in the strength of the storms, and those are primarily due to differences in the microphysics schemes um, that we used. And, and in this final slide, I want to compare, um, and the top I have, uh, a time series of, of Bill, the updraft helicity, and also the Cape on the right. And I just want to emphasize, we've looked at diurnal cycles and you see a really strong diurnal cycle in this inland storm, much stronger updraft helicity in the afternoon. And that's when the tornadoes occurred and they're tied in with surface heating and a much larger Cape. Um, the updraft helicities in the for Hurricane Irma, which I have down in the bottom of bottom left, are much stronger, but really not much of a diurnal cycle. And that was the case that occurred over Florida. There's much more ocean influence there. In the in the Bill case, we're already well inland, so you'd expect a little bit more of a diurnal cycle. So just to summarize, um, uh, we've done convection allowing simulations before to look at the mesoscale environments. For a coastal and inland case of a landfalling tropical cyclone tornadoes, uh, we've had pretty good success in predicting the tracks once inland, and this is all using the WARF model. Uh, the physics ensembles do show some sensitivities. Um, updraft helicity is a promising uh, model tornado surrogate for the landfalling tropical cyclones. We're now kind of working on optimizing the layers in which to analyze it. There's some indication that. Um, you know, we might want to use different layers and different thresholds than have been used for, for uh, continental tornadoes. Um, um, we've, we've emphasized the spatial patterns in the environmental variables uh, relative to the tornado locations. Uh, not too surprisingly, the tornadoes are mostly uh, located on the right flank or down shear from the tropical cyclone center. And um, uh, the vertical shear strength um, seems very important, particularly important for these cases. Um, uh, we've also looked at other uh, predictors uh, that are more specific, um, such as the tropical cyclone tornado parameter, supercell composite parameter. But again, we really haven't found anything that's better than the low level shear at lowest, you know, in the lowest three kilometers or so above the surface. So. Uh, I'll end there and uh, take any questions if, if there's time. Thanks, Dan. Yes, we do have some time for uh, a question or two. Um, I don't believe I see any in the chat, but if you have a question you want to ask, uh, please use the reactions button to raise your hand. I'm not seeing any right now. And Stan, you already answered the question I was going to ask on your last slide about the uh, layers for computing UH for tropical cyclones. I think that could be interesting to look into. And I, I should point out that, you know, um, there are also people that are working on this, uh, you know, 
with machine learning in more sophisticated ways, but we, we still think it's really interesting to kind of look at the differences between uh, using updraft helicity as it's been typically used with, say, for Oklahoma tornadoes, uh, you know, comparing it with, with these hurricane environments, which are very different. The shear is maybe more confined to lower levels and the Cape isn't as large. So um, um, that's been of interest to us. Yep, and Glenn just wrote in the chat, given the shear is concentrated low to the surface, is it also useful to consider Cape near the surface, like zero to three kilometers? Yeah, we've started to look at that too. I don't, uh, don't really have much to say about it yet, but that's a good suggestion. All right. Okay, thanks very much, Stan. Uh, we are on a break now until 10.30, and we'll see you all there. And uh, I'll give you a two minute warning. And for all the speakers, I'll just give you a two minute warning. Okie doke. All right. Well, by my clock, it's uh, 1030. So we'll get started in this uh, second group of talks. Uh, first up is Sarah Tessendorf, and she's going to talk about hail prediction with improved microphysics. Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to first acknowledge my team that's been working on this with me, including Anders, Amanda, Greg, and Maria, and go ahead and get started. So our goal of this work has been to improve the representation of grapple and hail in the Thompson microphysics scheme. This is a single combined hydrometeor category in the scheme. And one of the problems with that scheme is that it's been a single moment scheme to date. Um, and yet at the same time, we know grapple and hail have a wide range of densities in reality. But with that single moment scheme, that density has been prescribed as a constant value for that combined hydrometeor category. And density of these particles matters quite a bit because fall speed depends on the density. The growth rates depend on the fall speed then. And so in addition, precipitation type and amount then can depend in part on the fall speed. So we feel that it's really important to predict the grapple density, and by doing so, it would allow more ice particle types to be represented in the model. So our solution was to develop a scheme where the grapple hail category now has multiple predicted moments, which would then allow the density and fall speed to vary. So at the bottom of this slide is a schematic depicting the existing thompson eidheimer microphysics scheme, which is also known as MP28 in the WARF name list. And it has three two moment um, variables, the cloud, rain, and ice. And so for each of these, the mass mixing ratio and the number concentration are being predicted. And then the two single moment variables are snow and grapple, which are both just having the mass mixing ratio predicted. Now I will point out that in this scheme, there is a diagnostic relationship for the n naught, the y-intercept parameter of the hail size distribution, um, which allows the concentration to vary, but it's not being explicitly predicted. It's being diagnosed. So moving to the new version of the scheme that we've been developing over the past few years, we're referring to this now as MP38 in the name list. Um, we have taken that single moment grapple hail category and made it a double moment category where we predict both the mass mixing ratio and number concentration, as well as a third predicted variable, which is the bulk volume mixing ratio. And from that, we can predict the density. Um, in addition, and I'll speak most of this presentation, we'll be looking at those updates to, to what we call MP38, but I also will show some results to some other modifications we made to MP28, which there's still some benefit to MP28, you know, it's less computational expense to run fewer predicted variables, and so that's what's currently being run operationally. But so what we did was there was a paper that came out in 2019 by Paul Field et al that um, presented some hail size distribution data measured from the T-28 aircraft. And using that data, we were able to then redefine this diagnostic relationship for n naught as well. So I have some results that I'll be sharing today from um, how the MP-28 new scheme um, changed things as well. 
So like I mentioned, we'll be looking at MP38, which is our new two moment plus predicted grapple density scheme, as well as this MP28 new scheme. Um, we're gonna look at impacts on storm structure and evolution, precipitation production, and of course on hail prediction. So as we were doing these developments, we did a lot of work with this MCS from Pecan. Um, this was an MCS that propagated across the state of South Dakota. As shown, you can see the storm reports from this case um, in the upper left, as well as the radar reflectivity at 7Z. Um, the corresponding 7Z model simulated reflectivity from each of these three flavors of the microphysics scheme are shown on the right. You can see that all three of these simulations produced a mature MCS, um, which were quite similar to one another, the exception being that the MP38 um, leading line of high reflectivity was a little bit more um, dispersed and wider than in the two MP8 versions of the scheme. Another thing that you might notice, though, is that at the same time at 7Z, this MCS in the model simulations is right over the eastern border of South Dakota, whereas at the same time in the observations, it was still toward the center of the state. So you can see that the simulations in all three of these are still producing an MCS that's moving through the state uh, quite a bit faster than what was observed. When we look in more detail at the reflectivity um, structure here, we're looking at histograms of observed reflectivity from the radar in blue at two different altitudes, at an upper level in the top row and a lower level in, a in the bottom row. So for a given row, the blue histograms are going to be the same because that's the observations. And then we have each column representing the different flavors of the microphysics. You can see that in the tail of the low level or the lower reflectivity value distributions, they're very similar among all three flavors of the microphysics. Where we see most of the differences are in the tail of higher reflectivities, which is where we would expect to see these differences since we are changing the representation of grapple and hail. Um, you'll notice at the upper levels in particular, MP38 does a really nice job capturing this distribution of reflectivities at the tail, as well as throughout the moderate ranges as well. Um, at the lower levels, MP38 and MP28 new both do a reasonable job of getting the um, tail of higher reflectivities um, compared to the original MP28. So, um, of course, we've been looking at the predictions of hail with these simulations to see how these changes to the scheme um, are impacting those predictions. So these are swaths over time of the maximum hail being simulated in the model at the K1 or surface level with the um, cross symbols denoting where there are storm reports of um, hail. And the color coding for both are the same um, size-based scale. So one thing that you can see up with the MP28 new in the upper right is that it produces a, a larger area of hail at the surface, but not necessarily larger values. In fact, some of the lower values are in, the, in those larger areas. Um, the MP38 scheme definitely is showing larger hail reaching the ground compared to either of these two. And we'll look that, at that in a little bit more detail um, on the next slide. So here we're now looking at histograms of the observed hail size from the storm reports in gray for each of these three. And then we're looking at the modeled um, maximum hail size at the K1 or surface level in orange. And you can see that between the MP28 old and MP28 new, which are the left and center panels, there's not really much change in the size distribution of, of hail in those two simulations. But we do start to see in MP38, we get the um, distribution of having larger sizes of hail being predicted at the surface, um, not quite to the same sizes that were observed, but certainly a step in the right direction. So one thing about working with storm reports that many of us can understand and appreciate is that they're pretty limited. And so one of the other ways that we've been doing evaluation of hail size has been using the MRMS mesh, which is a radar derived maximum estimated size of hail. And so here we're looking at um, mesh from the radar in the upper left with the mesh from the three flavors of microphysics and the other panels, um, the simulated um, maximum hail size that we're seeing now is actually simulated over, um, as the maximum size in a two-dimensional column, um, which is more in line with how the mesh is being calculated with it being an integration over uh, reflectivity over a certain uh, layer of the atmosphere. 
Again, you can see the MP28 new, which is in the upper right, produces pretty large area of hail, and it actually has some of the larger sizes aloft. But um, the as we saw in the previous data, when we get down at the surface, not many of those um, are falling out as larger sizes at the surface anymore. In MP38, you can see actually the again the the swath of hail is a lot more focused and narrow, um, which is much more in line with what we're seeing here. Um, from the mesh at this time. If we look at look at it in a histogram sense, um, you can see here in the top, this is MP28 old versus MP38. Um, we're looking at the mesh from Nexrad here, which is the blue distribution, and then looking at the orange distribution, which is the max at the surface level. Um, not, now this is at the K1 level again. You can see again that the MP38 definitely gets um, that tail of larger hail sizes um, being distributed throughout the domain compared to what MP28 was able to predict. And that is much more in line with what we're seeing with the observations as well. One other aspect that we like to look at as we make these changes in the microphysics scheme is the impact on cold pool. Um, it's been known that the cold pools have been quite strong in some of the um, in, in the in the scheme to date. And so we wanted to quantify if there have been any impacts in, in changing this grapple hail scheme on the cold pool. So what we have plotted on the right are four different ASOS stations. Um, the A station is the westernmost station, B is, and then they go B, C, D, where D is the Sioux Falls, so it's the easternmost station. So you can see, based on the black dots, which are the observations, you can see that the time of cold pool passage, here the top panel is temperature and the bottom panel is wind speed, you can see the time of cold pool um, passage progresses as you go um, eastward in these stations. So now the color shading is the, um, corresponding output from the model simulation. And you can see again that that disparity in timing of cold pool passage is almost two hours different here in this first station where we get this major cold pool being produced at around 4Z and it's not really being observed until just before 6Z. Um, the other thing that you'll notice is that the strength of the cold pool, and, and you can look and you'll see this over multiple stations, the strength of that cold pool um, change is quite strong compared to the observations. But we also will note that there is you know, a difference in the antecedent temperatures at the surface as well, where the model is much warmer than the surface temperatures being observed. Um, nonetheless, we're still getting a cold pool change that's a little bit too strong, but you will notice that the blue shading, which is the um, model output surrounding the ASOS from MP38, is slightly less than, um, than the cold pool production from the MP28 um, simulations. So you, you especially can start to see this here in panel C. And then by the time we get to Sioux Falls, you can see that um, both MP38 and MP28 new have slowed down their um, system a little bit more, and it's getting a little bit closer to the observed passage. Um, and so we do see some impacts on cold pool. It's not as much as we would like to see changed. We would clearly like to be able to make a change where we can get closer to the observed cold pool so that these systems propagate through at appropriate times. So all of these results that I just presented on this pecan case, the description of the new scheme and so forth has been written up and submitted in a paper led by Anders Jensen et al. Uh, it's currently in review. Now that was all just looking at a single case, which is often a nice way when we're doing developments. But if we really want to quantify the impacts, it's important to do more of a comprehensive evaluation and not just rely on individual case studies. And so we've also run a 30 day retrospective over the month of May 2019, which corresponds with the hazardous weather test bed um, spring experiment in 2019. And we've been using mode TD for object based evaluation, comparing the MP28 original scheme to the MP38 scheme. Um, this table here is just showing you the number of objects that were identified in each of the two schemes, as well as in the observations. The top half represents a mode threshold with a smaller radius and higher precipitation intensity threshold. So this really is identifying objects that are um, smaller scale and more like cores of storms versus we've also been looking at it with um, 
a larger scale radius and a lower intensity threshold to get those bigger objects as well. The number of matches where the where mode matches the um, forecast objects to the observed objects is actually quite small, especially for the smaller scale systems where you're gonna, where you're going to have less spatial overlap to, to match them. Um, and so most of our analysis is focusing on looking at the statistical distributions of different parameters for all of the objects compared to observations. We are doing some analysis with the matched data, though, but given it's a smaller sample, I'm not going to focus too much time on it today. Um, a couple things that I'll just run through that we're looking at here with the mode TD analysis from that 30 day retrospective are storm propagation speed and duration, propagation speed on the left, duration on the right. Um, the left half of each of these panels is the um, larger scale, lower intensity threshold mode objects versus the um, right half is the smaller scale, higher intensity threshold. And you can see that in the storm propagation speed, we see very little difference between these populations of, from the different simulations or the observations. However, when we look at the object duration, we see a decrease in the storm duration from MP28 to MP38 at both of the mode object scales that once we compare the MP38 distribution observations, it looks quite good, like it's a step in the right direction, that these um, storms are now shorter in duration, more in line with the observations. Uh, these are not significant differences, but it's still a notable difference. When we look at precipitation intensity, um, here on the left, we're looking at the 90th percentile of precipitation intensity within each object versus on the right, we're looking at the 99th percentile of precipitation intensity. Um, you can see that for the larger scale objects on the left half of each of these panels, there's really similar distributions. Um, but when we look on the right half for the smaller cores, you'll see that MP28 is a little bit low compared to the observations where MP38 is a little bit high. Um, they're still not significantly different from one another, um, but perhaps we have a little bit of a Goldilocks thing happening here. Um, but either way, they're pretty similar. And then we're also interested in evaluating hail prediction using mode as well. So what we're doing now um, is using the mode objects and incorporating the MRMS mesh in order to look at the um, hail size distributions from mesh within the observed objects compared to that within the simulated objects. Um, we're in the process of running this for the whole month, but I'm going to just show you a test case from our Mar uh, May 20th event here that you can see moved over Texas and Oklahoma. The observed reflectivity and is shown here as well as the reflectivity from the simulation from MP28 old and MP38 shown on the right. And I'm just going to skip this because I think I'm getting shorter on time. So um, this is just a comparison for the matched objects now, which in this case, we had between four to six objects identified on this case um, and only two matched objects. But with the matched objects, we can look at scatter plots like this where um, there, like I said, there's two matched objects here. One of those is represented by the squares. The other one is represented by the circles. And the MP28 sizes are in blue. The MP38 sizes are in green. And so at least in this one case, we can see that the MP38 is, again, predicting larger maximum hail sizes, um, which are generally more in line with what was observed um, with the, based on the mesh. Um, but we will be running this for the full 30 days so that we can look at this not only in that statistical distribution when we have our 30 day um, objects analyzed, we'll be able to look at look at all of the objects as well as we'll continue to look at the um, matched objects to see if we see representative um, results between the two populations. So just to wrap up, we've made updates to the Thomson Eidheimer microphysics scheme um, to the one moment scheme, which we referred to in this presentation as MP28 new. We made updates to the diagnostic for N not for the grapple hail category based on observations from field at all. And then we developed a second um, new version of the scheme, which we refer to as MP38, which is includes a two moment version with predicted grapple density um, and when we did that, adding that number concentration and density prediction to the grapple hail scheme, that led to increased hail sizes at the surface, which were in better agreement with the hail reports and radar derived mesh. It led to shorter storm durations, which was more in agreement with the observations as well. 
And um, as noted in the pecan case, it also led to reduced cold pool strength, not as much as we would like to see, but it's moving in the right direction. We are in the process of also evaluating the um, cold pool strength for our mode TD objects as well. Um, and that will be another way to see if this um, impact on cold pool that we saw in that pecan case is represented across the full month of cases from that May 2019 retrospective. So we have some ongoing challenges. Thank you. Um, we first of all continue to, to have a challenge representing hail melting processes. And you know this is a common problem with bulk microphysics schemes. Um, we know from previous studies that hail melting is a size dependent process and bulk microphysics schemes don't really handle that well. Um, bin microphysics scheme studies have indicated that, you know, if, if the instantaneous shedding is um, performed like it is in most bulk schemes, that that might result in stronger cold pools and enhanced storm propagation. So we feel that this melting process issue is one that we really need to address if we wanna continue making progress on getting storm structure and evolution with that cold pool dynamic um, in, into better territory. The other ongoing issue that we have though, of course, too, is that you know we need convection to form in the right place, the right time and the right intensity because those are still the parameters that dictate um, the ability for hail to even grow. So um, our future directions, we're gonna get back into some more process studies. Now that we've added this new part to the scheme, we wanna focus on some process studies using the Relampago field program where there's these comprehensive observations of hailstorms and floods and, and collaborate with our step team, especially the data assimilation and hydrological teams on doing that research. And then we also want to um, explore using Lagrangian microphysics to study hail growth and melting. Um, Lagrangian microphysics um, can better reproduce the microphysical particle size distribution and growth properties as they're advected through the cloud. Um, this process or this method is also known as the super drop method as described in Grabowski et al. 2019. So I will stop there. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat right now, though I've got one for you that I will put in the chat in a little bit. And I okay. think we'll move on for the sake of time. So thanks okay. very much. Sure. Uh, up next is Jin Kyung K, talking about assimilating lower atmospheric wind and thermodynamic profiles and their impact on convective weather forecasts. So can you see my screen? Yep, looks good now. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Jungkyung K from NCA EOL. And the uh, title of today's talk is the impact of assimilating low atmospheric wind and thermodynamic profiles on convective weather forecast over the corners. Uh, and this work is in collaboration with Dr. Tammy Records and Glenn Lomine from NCA and Dr. Dave Turner from NOAA and uh, Dr. Michael Ng uh, from NERSC, uh, who was the former ASK postdoc at NCAR. Okay, uh, so the atmospheric boundary layer impact the society in the form of the daily uh, weather, forecast, weather forecast and air quality. So the profiles in atmospheric boundary layer are essential for a wide range of application for example, the, it can be used for the initialization of a numerical weather prediction model for hazardous weather. And also it can be used for the aviation safety application. So many studies have shown that the dynamic and thermodynamic profiles having higher temporal higher temporal resolution less than 15 minutes and vertical resolution less than 10, min, 10 meter are required for this application. So there are uh, conventional observation for the atmospheric boundary layer, for example, zoned and aircraft data, but this data uh, has the very, very low temporal and the spatial resolution. So the, they are not suitable for the major scale analysis. So these days, the ground-based remote sensing uh, are getting popularity. So for example, ARI and Doppler LIDAR and MPD. So the MPD, 
uh, it's a micropulse differential absolution LIDAR, uh, which was developed by uh, ANCA EOL and Montana State University. Uh, it is a safe and autonomous LIDAR-based active remote sensing that measure the absolute humidity profile data uh, from 300 meter to uh, about five kilometer height. And the area, the infrared radiance-based passive remote sensing uh, it measured the temperature and water vapor, mix, uh, water vapor mixing ratio profiles, and uh, it can measure the this, this quantity from the 10 meter to 2 kilometer height. Uh, it has very high resolution near the surface, but the resolution decreased very uh, rapidly with the height. And the plot LiDAR measured the 3D wind using the aerosol backscatter information, and also it can reach the from 20 meter to about 3 kilometer height. So this figure shows the vertical range of these three different profiling data. And we can see that uh, they has the very different vertical range. So it is very important to know, investigate the combined impact of these three different uh, observation uh, as well as the individual impact. So we utilize the, the data uh, near the Lemont, Oklahoma. Uh, during the, from 12 to, uh, 12 to April 2019 to 19 July 2019, about three months period. So we did, we deployed the uh, five MPD area and the plot LIDAR at this five site. When we zoom in there, uh, we can see the map of this site, the red dot here. And this is the example of a time series of MPD area and the plot LIDAR observation. So using this observation from this field campaign, uh, in this study, we want to evaluate the observation impact from a simulation of the temperature and water vapor profiles from area data and uh, water vapor profile from MPD and the wind profiles from the Doppler LiDAR to improve analysis field and measure scale forecast scale of a precipitation event. And, and also we would like to assess the value of combined and individual profile data from MPD area and the LIDAR. So we choose one presentation case on 14 June 2000, 2019. Uh, this is the rate observation and this uh, area shows the, our targeted, uh, targeted area. And when we see the weather chart that there are strong low level jet that transport the moisture field into this target area. And so we can also find uh, some balcony instability and thermal, thermal advection uh, near this area here. And this is the experimental design. We assimilate the conventional observation at every three hour from the 00TC 13 June 2019 to 03 TC 14 June 2019 here. And then we start to assimilate the, our profiling data from 03 TC 14 June to 06 UTC 14 June here. And we have conducted five different data assimilation experiments. So first, we the experiment conv here means it means that we assimilate the just conventional observation and experiment or all means that we assimilate the conventional observation and three the, uh, profiling data. And additionally, we also conduct three different denial experiment. So deny DL means that we exclude the Doppler light observation from all experiment here. And also deny MPD and deny array. Uh, we exclude the MPD and array data from this all experiment configuration. Uh, I used the WAP model and that has the two nested domain having the 15 and 3 kilometer resolution and both of them has the same 70, to, uh, 70 level, vertical level and I used uh, this uh, set of physical parameterization. And I used the DART uh, ensemble data simulation system using the 60 member. Yeah, so this is the result. Uh, uh, this is the reflectivity forecast and uh, fraction, fr fractional scale score for one hour accumulated precipitation. So when we, and this first low shows the observation, 
And when we compare this conventional and old experiment, so we can see that this uh, assimilating the old profiling data improved the forecast in terms of the, the intensity, structure, and the timing of the conviction. And also when we compare these three different denier experiment, uh, looks very similar. However, when we compare this old experiment and deny MPD experiment, uh, this improvement are uh, mostly contributed by this MPD observation. Um, and when we see that this fractional skill score, uh, it's very interesting that uh, assimilating the Doppler LiDAR degrade the presentation forecast at early lead time before two hour forecast. Uh, uh, we are still investigating the reason, but we are not included this one in this study. So except for this uh, Doppler LiDAR result, this all its all experiment, this black dotted line shows the highest skill score than the other experiment and followed by deny ARI, deny the Doppler LiDAR and deny MPD. Uh, this means that this uh, improvement by all experiments are mainly attributed by the MPD observation and followed by ARI data and Doppler LiDAR wind data. Uh, this is the neighborhood ensemble probability forecast uh, for one hour precipitation forecast. So this figure, first figure shows the observation and this five figure shows this uh, ensemble probability. Um, uh, this result is very consistent with the fractional skill score. So the Doppler LiDAR uh, denied Doppler LiDAR shows the most consistent uh, structure with observation for and uh, all experiment followed by the whole experiment and deny ARI and deny MPD. So when we compare this all experiment and deny MPD here, so assimilating the MPD collect the horizontal distribution uh, horizontal distribution of precipitation ensemble forecast. Uh, it also changed the orient of this uh, structure. And also when we compare this all and deny ARI experiment, the including ARI observation uh, increased the, this ensemble probability northeast of the site. And also this oscillating doctor LiDAR uh, lower the, this uh, ensemble probability northeast of the site. So this is the convergence for analysis field at two kilometer height. So we can see that uh, this blue line shows, blue color shows the convergence and the red line shows the divergence field. So the old experiment shows the most strongest convergence, especially the west of the observing site. This black five dot shows the observing site. And also, when we compare this old experiment and deny MPD here, the, this strong convergence are mainly attributed by this MPD observation or a vapor profile. And the deny area and deny DL shows very similar structure and intensity of convergence. So when we see the particle profile of this convergence averaged over this area, uh, all experiment shows very similar structure for the, having the most uh, strongest convergence near the two kilometer height and the weak divergence near uh, below the 0.5 kilometers. So this means that this experiment has the convection may have the high base. So when we see the cross section along the line A and B that pass the observing site, uh, this left panel shows the water vapor mixing ratio analysis and the light panel shows the temperature analysis. And this first figure shows the full field from all experiment. And this four different, four figures shows the difference field between all and uh, the other DA experiment. So when you see this, uh, this figure, the difference between all and deny MPD the MPD, we can see that the MPD contribute to the lowering the water vapor mixing ratio east of the site at low level. So this triangle shows the location of the central observing site. So this blue color means that the MPD uh, contribute to lowering the water vapor at east of the site. And 
this is very similar with this uh, difference field be, uh, between O and com conventional observation experiment. And when we see the temperature field, uh, most prominent uh, features in here is that we, we can found that uh, in the old and deny area uh, experiment here. So the area contribute to lowering the temperature below 2 kilometer five, 2.5 kilometer height along the site. So using this, uh, from this two result, the combined MPD and area make the air drier uh, east of the site and the, where the precipitation occurs and the, make the air cooler uh, at the low level. So this combined evaporating effect uh, correct the horizontal distribution of the precipitation. So make this area uh, drier and cooler. So this MPD collect this the room position and of the precipitation forecast. So we can remember that the ARI data have uh, some improvement of precipitation forecast northeast of this site here. So we also see the cross section along the line C and D here. So when it compare the cross section uh, along line A and B, the most different uh, most different thing we can found in this area uh, in these figures. So. The assimilating the airy data uh, make the air the more warmer in this area uh, at low level here. And so we see the security plot at this location here. So we can see that the, this dotted line is from the deny airy experiment. So the assimilating the airy data uh, increase the water vapor field and uh, decrease the temperature field below the three kilometer height. So I additionally uh, simulate the area temperature and area Q observation into this deny area experiment separately. So we can found that uh, this improvement by all experiment are mainly attributed by this area, uh, area temperature uh, observation. So this means that or when we are simulating the MPD observation, then the, this MPD correct this the thermodynamic structure near this observing site. And also when we added the area temperature observation, then by using the cross correlation between this observing temperature, this temperature and the, this the water vapor field. So we can also collect this thermodynamic field around this area. So we can improve the forecast in this northeast of the site. Uh, this is the most unstable cape. And we can also very consistent result with this previous one. So when we are simulating the old profiling data, we can find the, some instability along this line. And uh, this is mainly attributed by the MPD observation. And also when we add the area data, especially temperature field, then we can also improve this instability field at the northeast of the site. So this is the summary and conclusion. Uh, short term forecast of a presentation of the MCS that occurred on 14 June 2019 are uh, improved by assimilating uh, all MPD area and the Polida profiling data in comparison to assimilating convention observation. And assimilating MPD water vapor profiling uh, contribute the most, uh, most to improving the presentation forecast skill over almost all forecast lead times and threshold. And this improvement of presentation forecast is attributed to the correction of most moist air east of the presentation system and the dry air west of the presentation system, and which improved the horizontal distribution distribution of presentation forecast around the site. And also when we include the area temperature profiling data, it in contribute positively to the presentation forecast in the northeast of the site. 
but here we can find that assimilating the polyida rather degrades the overall forecast skill at early forecast lead time by reducing the ensemble forecast performance of the precipitation to the northeast of the site. So we are still investigating this one. So maybe next time we can share this result. So in the so future work, okay, uh, we are still uh, diagnosed the profiling observation impact for more convective cases. And we are interested in the uh, clear sky case. So we are in investigate the MPD area and the polyida impact on the diurnal cycle representation. And uh, we want to diagnose the model error in PBS scheme. And finally, we will assess, assess the potential value of combined and individual profile data from MPD area and the polyida as a remote sensing addition to the supplement to the uh, National Medinet program. So thank you for attending and I'd like to take a question. Thanks, we got about a minute if anyone has any questions. I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but please raise your hand if you've got a question. Uh, there's one from Jenny, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, so um, that's a good talk. Uh, so my question is in regard to uh, the, the larger impact uh, uh, from MPD compared to the ARI. So do you think yes. that's mainly because uh, the larger observation depth in uh, MPD? Uh, first of all, I think that the MPD has the more deep range mm. than the ARI data for this case, mm. because the, they, these two the measurement has a different strategy for retrieval. So they don't have a, they have a different range. So that's the one reason. Mm -hmm. And also the, in this case, for this case, the water vapor the, are very localized. The impact, the observing impact for the water vapor is very localized. So the area temperature has the more broad impact and it spread the observing impact to the other area. So that's the reason why the MPD and area has to shows the different impact. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. We'll move on to our next speaker, Xiao Chun Lin, who will be talking about assimilation of New York State Mesonet surface and profiler data for June 21st, 2021 convective event. Uh, Looks good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Um, um, today I'm going to talk about a case study by assimilating neurostem mesonet data. And first, I'd like to thank Jenny, Tammy, Jin Kang, and Everett for their help on this work. And I also like to thank neurostem mesonet for providing the data. So um, the nearest state mesonet has provided continuous in situ and remote sensing observations near the surface and within the lower troposphere since 20, uh, 2017. So here on the map shows the whole uh, network, including several subnetworks. And especially we have profiler subnetwork deployed across the states, which is marked as a red triangle on the map here. And at each profiler site, there are Doppler LiDAR and microwave radiometer for high temporal vertical wind and thermodynamic profiling on the planetary boundary layer. So with a dense observing network, uh, the mesonet can capture the evolution of the mesoscale weather system moving across the state. And we believe it's also uh, beneficial for severe weather forecasting. And in the summer, uh, the precipitating events across New York State are typically associated with cold fronts and the complex terrain and its interaction with low level flow could affect the evolution and intensity of the uh, precipitating system. So in this study, we would like to understand will the inclusion of low level wind 
moisture and temperature from neural state mesonets in the initial state could improve the forecast on the structure, strength, and the evolution of the severe weather system. So um, the case we choose is a convective event on June 21st to 22nd last year in 2021. And um, in the morning of June 21st uh, at 12 UTC, uh, there was a warm front moving northward across the New York state. The state is within this yellow box here. So, and behind the warm front, there was a southerly wind bringing warm and moist air into the state. And at 18 UTC, there was a cold front moving from the west, and it continues to move uh, eastward across the state. And uh, ahead of the cold front, uh, a line of convection was triggered. And it can be clearly seen on the next red compass and um, composite reflectivity. So the convective line uh, moving to the state intensified and decay and then re-intensify as it moved eastward. And the evolution of the convective line can be quantified by uh, the aerial average precipitation from NCEP stage four data in, and uh, within the New York state, especially from the precipitation intensity greater than 20 millimeter as shown in green line on this plot. So um, there are two peaks of the precipitation during the period. So I divided the lifetime of this convect, uh, convective line into two stages. So in stage one, uh, the convective line moved uh, into New York from west and then intensify as it moved eastward. And there was a tornado touchdown in central New York, marked as the black star on the map here at 2150 UTC. And then the convective line decayed as the precipitation decreased from 22 to zero UTC. And in stage two, uh, the convective line re-intensified as it moved over uh, the confluence of Mohawk River Valley and uh, uh, Hudson River Valley here. As shown, there's, there was a, a precipitation maximum on the map and also on this uh, time series. And the convection then decay as they move into mountain, mountains in Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. And the passage of the convective system was also captured by Masonet. So here I pick three standard sites uh, marked as red dots on the map here. So for each site, um, we see the drops in potential temperature and water vapor missing ratio, and the increase in station pressure and also in uh, wind speed, and the change in wind direction at the same time. So the signal uh, indicates the passage of the cold pool associated with the convective system. So um, to understand the impacts of a simulating near state mass on mass surface and profiler data on the convection forecast, um, three experiments were conducted, including the control experiments in which only the conventional observations were assimilated. And the conventional observations are um, NCEP ADP global and surface observations. Um, and they are assimilated every six hours from 12 UTC to 18 UTC on June 21st by GSI based 3D bar method. And the figure on the bottom right shows the available observations at 12 and 18 UTC DA cycles within the model domains. So here, um, the top row shows the hourly accumulated precipitation from stage four data. And the bottom row shows the uh, control forecast. So we see um, the forecast they capture the intensification at 22 UTC in stage one. However, in stage two, uh, the system in the forecast move, move much faster than the stage, uh, stage four data at zero UTC. And also it did not capture the uh, re-intensification over the Mohawk Hudson confluence at two UTC on June 22nd. And the stage two is more affected by local topography and its interaction with low level flow, which we believe the bassinet data could help. 
So uh, we will focus on the reintensification in uh, stage two in the following slides. So, um, and we conducted two experiments that is control plus surface experiments and a control plus NYSM experiments. So for the surface experiments, only the mesonet surface data were assimilated. But for the uh, NYSM experiments, both the surface and profiler data were assimilated. And they are assimilated every one hour from 18 UTC to one UTC also by the GSI based 3D VAR method. And for the control plus NYSM experiments, uh, we did data thinning for the profiler sites around New York City because the profilers are much denser down here in New York City. And the figure on the right shows the profiler sites used in this city with a better forecast skill. And we also run several data denial experiments to understand the sensitivity of convection forecast to thermodynamic and wind profile information provided by Doppler LiDAR and microwave radiometer, especially for the uh, convection reintensification at 2 UTC. So there are uh, four experiments in, um, for the all experiments, which is our baseline experiments, both the LiDAR wing and micro radiometer temperature and moisture were assimilated. And for the deny MWRQ experiments, the retrieved moisture from micro radiometer were discarded. And the deny MWRT experiments, uh, the retrieved temperature from uh, micro radiometer were discarded. And the last one, deny MWR experiments, uh, only the LiDAR wing data were assimilated. So focus on the two UTC, the reintensification. Uh, the stage four data uh, sh show the maximum precipitation over Mohawk Hudson confluence. And for the model forecast initialized at uh, zero UTC embedded at two UTC, the control forecasted the convection, convective line located to the east of the uh, stage four data. And with the assimilation uh, of uh, mesonet surface data, the convective line moved uh, slower and was located within the state, but it located to north to the stage four data. And with the assimilation of um, mesonet profiler data, the maximum precipitation located much closer to the um, mohawk Hudson confluence. However, if the moisture were uh, discarded, the moisture from micro radiometer were discarded, the forecast uh, degraded and it's clear more uh, worse than the con control forecast. And we believe that degradation is due to the bias in microwave radiometer temperature. And on the contrary, um, if the temperature from the microwave radiometer or all the microwave radiometer uh, data were discarded, it shows the uh, improvement on forecast on the structure intensity and also the location of the convection. And we also use the fraction skill score to evaluate the hourly precipitation forecast from 19 UTC to 2 UTC. And among these experiments, the all deny MWRT and deny MWR experiments show the higher fraction skill score for forecast after 22 UTC. And it imp implies the improvements on the precipitation forecast by assimilating mesonet data, especially the profiler data. And next, uh, I would like to discuss the possible mechanism to the reintensification over Moho Hudson confluence to understand why the assimilation of profiler data could result in a better forecast. And here shows the uh, next red composite reflectivity and 10 meter wind vector and two meter uh, equivalent potential temperature at Masonet uh, standard site one hour before the uh, maximum precipitation. Uh, and in the circle area, uh, there was a wind convergence, which is also known as uh, as Mohawk Hudson convergence. Uh, and as you can see over the uh, Mohawk River Valley, as I use a red line to represent where the valley is, 
there was a, a cold and dense west leaf uh, outflow from the old convection. And over the uh, Hudson River Valley, there was a, a warm and moist southerly wind here, and they convert the, these two flows converge over the confluence of uh, Mohawk and Hudson Rivers. And this might enhance the convection over here. So I'm zooming into the region in this dark blue box uh, to evaluate the wind convergence forecast from all the experiments. And we find for the, in the all D9MWRT and D9MWR experiments, they all forecasted the westerly wind converge with the southerly wind at the place where the uh, maximum precipitation was. And it also shows the increase in uh, column integrated rainwater mixing ratio at a convergence zone. So in summary, uh, the evolution of the convective line was captured by the high temporal and spatial uh, sampling of newer stem mesonets. And it is hypothesized that the, the convection reintensification near a capital region or uh, over the confluence of Mohawk River and Hudson River was due to the convergence of Wesley outflow from old convection over Mohawk River Valley and the uh, southly wing over Hudson River Valley. And the forecast on reintensification of the convection over Mohawk Hudson confluence was improved by the, the assimilation of new stem mesonet data especially the LIDAR wind data because of the improvements on Mohawk Hudson convergence. And this study demonstrates the benefits of assimilated, uh, assimilating near stem mesonet surface and provided data to the summertime severe weather forecast. And I also like to um, investigate if the assimilation of uh, the mesonet data could also help for the uh, presentation type forecast in in cool season, especially near uh, under near freezing condition. And however, our result is sensitive to micro radiometer temperature, likely due to a data quality issue. And we will investigate the error sources of a micro radiometer and explore how to optimally assimilate micro radiometer data in the future. So, and that's all I have, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. We've got time for questions. Please either put it in the chat or raise your hand. I've got a question. Um, so that experiment where you, I guess, denied, deny MWRQ, mm -hmm. that's a pretty shocking difference in terms of precipitation. Yeah. Right. So in that one, you, you just denied the moisture observations, correct? Yeah, that's like sticking out to me. I mean, you're basically changing the entire like kind of synoptic situation to, to some extent, or at least the, the mesoscale situation. Yeah. Um, do you know what's going on there? I think it's, well, I hypothesize that's because of the bias in micro radiometer temperature. So I actually did a, a bias correction of the micro radiometer temperature uh, data. And I think it shows improved. So it, it's still uh, over forecasted precipitation, but I think it did improve the forecast. Yeah, the, the thing that concerns me the most is really the precipitation back in Western New York State, you know, behind a boundary, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, so that might be something to look into. I mean, it almost looks on a scale that it could be a bug. Um, just a thought. Yeah. That, yeah, that just um, a much bigger difference than I would expect from, from a sort of experiment like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Xiao Qing spent um, quite a lot of time to deal with um, uh, temperature errors in the macro 
uh, with um, you know temperature observation. So I th we really think that temperature observation cannot be used, should not be used. Uh, so when I, I, my 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 guess is uh, when she used both uh, humidity and the temperature from the uh, microwave radiometer, um, that bias is kind of a, a hidden somehow. I don't, I don't still, I don't, we, we don't fully understand yet, but she would do more uh, analysis. But I think it's related to the bias in the temperature observation. But of course, why when she include the humidity, then it's not that bad. <laughs> Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much. Uh, yeah. Thanks to all the speakers uh, this morning. And uh, I guess we are moving on to, oh, Glenn just put something in there. He just said, it's interesting. It doesn't strongly impact the results when all observations are used. And perhaps there are differences in the observation error. So that might be another thing to, to mm -hmm. consider. But I think we would be moving on to uh, the breakout group discussion. So. I want the powers that be handle that. So um, Sarah, can you be the lead in room five? Oh, we, maybe we don't need so many rooms. I don't know. How many rooms are we having? I set up five, but it looks like a lot of people are leaving. Like there's only two in room five, three in room four now. People uh -huh. just jump off three in room one. Yeah, I don't know. Do you want me to move people? Um. Mm, yeah, maybe we can. I'll move Joe and Sarah into room up. four. Uh -huh. I don't know if it'll let me. Yeah, okay. So hopefully it will let them. And then, yeah, I don't know. Let's see. I guess I could combine, well, let me move Matt and Glenn into room two and Jared into room three. Does that sound good? Okay. I hope they don't get, they're gonna be like, where'd everybody go? <laughs> okay, let's see if they do it. One, two, three. Okay, there we go. So now I have four in room one, five in room two, and five in room four. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I promised there were like, you know, seven in each, and then it's everybody just leaves right before it breaks out. Yeah. Makes it hard, but. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think that that works. Mm -hmm. oh. All right. I did it without telling them. So hopefully they, I'm sure they figured it out by now. They're all in there, so. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you. I'll join room one. All right, perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you. Jenny. Sure. <laughs>